are two core, two systems of chords. Ten, Mississippi. To do the fourteenth. Um, all right, Secretary of State. Secretary of State deals with everything outside of America. Deals with everything outside. Hi, and welcome back to Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC Academy, where today we're going to be talking about the Constitutional Convention in 1787. And in particular, we're going to focus on how the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation that we discussed last time were addressed by the convention delegates. Now, last time we also talked about how Shays' Rebellion finally demonstrated to Americans that the Articles were just too weak and this leads us back to the same benchmark we began last time, which says to identify how weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation led to the writing of the Constitution. And this time we're going to focus more on the writing of the Constitution. And just a reminder, teachers, that this PowerPoint and lesson plans are available at Teachers Paid Teachers, Mr. Raymond's Civics EOC Academy. So the convention took place four years after the end of the Revolutionary War, and America was trying to rebuild after eight years of war. The delegates, and remember a delegate is a representative, the delegates met in Philadelphia to address the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. The 55 delegates representing 12 of 13 states, now Rhode Island didn't send any representatives, Rhode Island, a small state, and this is a theme that's going to be coming up, small states not happy. The delegates met in the same building in which the Declaration of Independence was written and signed. Now, rather than trying to fix the Articles of Confederation, they scrapped it. They figured we need to write a whole new one and start from scratch. And to add legitimacy to this gathering, they chose the hero of the Revolutionary War, George Washington, to head up, to lead the convention. So the delegates addressed three of the weaknesses pretty easily. One of the first powers they put into the new constitution was the power to tax. And from our last video, you know what a mess it was that they didn't give themselves the power to tax. They had difficulties fighting the war. They couldn't stop things like Shays' Rebellion. The states were broke. They couldn't pay their soldiers. So this was a huge problem. Now, next, they created the three branches, adding the executive and the judicial. And remember, they had a legislative branch under the Articles, the Continental Congress. But since they had no one to enforce the law, which is what the executive branch does, and they had no one to interpret or judge the law, which is the judicial branch, they added these two new branches. And next, they established a Commerce Clause. Remember, commerce is to trade. And this gave the central government the power to regulate foreign and interstate trade, which had been a big problem under, this, under the Articles. Remember, states were taxing other states, and states were making deals with other countries, and this was a big problem. But some of the problems at the Constitutional Convention would need a little more compromise. And one of the problems we discussed last time was that under the Articles, each state had one vote in Congress. And large states like Virginia and New York, who had to take on a much bigger role during the Revolutionary War, both in costs and losses, they were not pleased with this arrangement. So two plans for the Congress were being pushed. One that would help the big states. This was known as the Virginia Plan in which representation in a two-house Congress, they were going to change it to a two-house Congress, would be based on population. And the other plan that came out was known as the New Jersey Plan, which would have a one-house Congress, like they had under the Articles, with equal votes per state. And this was pushed by the small states, who were basically happy 
with the Congress as it was under the Articles of Confederation. So a solution was arrived at known as the Great Compromise, which created a two-house Congress with one based on population known as the House of Representatives and one known as the Senate with equal representation. Okay, so here we see the House of Reps, and this made the big states happy. And the Senate made the small states happy, and still do today. Now, this did more than just make the states happy. By creating a two-house legislature, the delegates were dividing power further. And this appealed to their enlightenment tendencies towards separation of powers. Remember Montesquieu, separating the powers. We will do an entire lesson on Congress later this year, but it's important to remember that the Great Compromise solved the problem of one state, one vote. Now, as can be expected, the change to the Articles of Confederation that caused the most anxiety was the creation of an executive. After all, having one person with a lot of power in the form of a chief executive or president sounded an awful lot like a king. And remember, fear of power is a central theme throughout this year. But there was another fear at the convention, and that was fear of the people. Yes, us. I don't want to say the delegates were a bunch of snobs, but they did consider themselves the elite. And they were the elite. You know, this was a time when only a tiny percentage of people went to college. Most of the people were farmers. And these guys were definitely more, I don't know, enlightened than the vast majority of Americans. And they worried that a charismatic person someone might be able to cause the people to elect some undeserving yet popular person to become president. Someone who wouldn't do a good job but was popular with the people. So they instituted a system for electing the president known as the Electoral College. The states would hold an election for the president in which the people would vote, and this is known as the popular vote. But afterwards, people called electors would gather to place the final vote for president in case the people had messed up. These electors would get together and count up the votes, and each state would have a number of electors equal to their representatives in Congress. So take, for example, Florida. Florida has 25 representatives in the House of Reps and two senators giving them a total of 27 electors. Every state is guaranteed at least three electors because each state has two senators and are guaranteed at least one representative in the House of Reps. So states like North Dakota with a very small population would have three electoral votes. Whereas large, the largest state, which is California, has 55 electors. So there's a total of 538 electors today, so a candidate needs 270 electoral votes to win. Sounds confusing, right? Yes, and, and that was partly on purpose. Again, to protect us from ourselves. We're going to go over this again when we get to politics and elections, so if you didn't get it right there, you're going to have another shot. Now, this system still exists today, and while some people think we should get rid of it, it's kind of part of our tradition the Electoral College. Okay, so here is a chart that you might want to write down. Just hit pause if you haven't been taking notes. You've been taking notes, right? So let's review. Problems of the articles, no levying taxes, check. We change that. No federal courts, check. No regulation of trade, check. No executive, check too hard to amend or pass laws. We haven't discussed that today, but now laws only require a simple majority that is one more than 50% to pass. And that was a change from two thirds, which was just really hard to get. And amendments, which were re required a unanimous vote. Remember, everyone agrees, and it's really hard to get everyone to agree on anything. And that was changed to two-thirds of Congress and three-fourths of the states, 
and we're going to do a whole lesson on amendments so we'll go over this again finally we have representation of states one vote per state was changed to a two house congress with the house of reps based on population and a senate with equal representation so the final document was put together and written up by james madison who's also known as the father of the constitution and it was signed by most of the delegates, but there were still some who were not happy about the new document, and they refused to sign. They thought it was too much power. And a big fight was still ahead because the states would now be asked to ratify the Constitution. And as hopefully you remember, the states were reluctant to give up all this new power to the national government. And that is where we'll pick up next time with ratifying the Constitution, and it's going to get political. So we will see you next time. Be sure to subscribe, and thanks for watching. Just a reminder, teachers, this PowerPoint, as well as lesson plans, are available at Teachers Pay Teachers. Just search for Mr. Raymond's EOC Academy. And again, thanks for watching.